The scientist, Albert Einstein, was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached into his vest pocket, but he couldn't find his ticket. So he went to his trouser pockets, couldn't find it. It wasn't there. So he looked in his briefcase, but couldn't find it. Then he looked at the seat beside him, and he still couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle, punching the tickets. As he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and saw the great phys uh, physicist on his hands and knees looking under his seat for his ticket. The conductor rushed back down and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. No problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you brought one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> True story. Let me start this morning by pointing out the obvious this morning. We live in a time when many and perhaps most people are challenged with or overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. They have a need to figure out where things are going. Some fear the future. They're concerned about what will happen because the future is full of possibilities. Others fear the past. They're upset at what has occurred, what they have done, or what others have done that continues to affect them. Still others are afraid of the present. They wonder, will they cope with the problems they face today? These challenges at times can grip their souls and control their lives. Sounds like me. How about you? In reality, folks like you and me wake up each day with untold burdens and anxiety which they struggle to deal with one day at a time. Things like conflict and finances or politics, things like health issues or even the planet's future have captured much of our attention. This morning in the quiet of your own heart, are you one of these people? Are you recognizing that in your own life? If you're like me, you might be even asking this question, so how does God want me to respond to anxiety and fear like this in my life? So I wonder, can our scripture this morning offer us some hope? Can it offer us a way forward, maybe? Our passage from the Gospel of John that Christina read reminds us that Jesus is the word, and the word produces a light meant to guide the way. The fifth verse of that passage, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. This promise suggests that God hears us and is with us as we cry out, as we cry out from our needs. Our familiar psalm for today was written by a shepherd who found favor with God and eventually found his way to be king of Israel. Our author, David, like us, was tempted to be anxious about situations and events in his own life. Yet with all the problems one would have as a ruler of a kingdom, he writes throughout his Psalms how he overcomes sorrow and fear by trusting and rejoicing in God's presence. The 23rd Psalm perhaps is one of the best loved and most well-known passages in all of scripture. And this psalm is one of those psalms where David shares his heart. His words are comforting because they're filled with images that if we try, we can understand. This passage is often read in times of stress or sorrow. We read this psalm in memorial services because people refer to it when facing times of grief and hardship. As we heard, they just read, the 23rd Psalm begins with, Yahweh, you are my shepherd. I want nothing more. That's 
It's a simple statement of faith and a description of the relationship between David and God. David uses a simple description that anyone of his day would have clearly understood. We have a different understanding of the relationship between a shepherd and sheep in our current culture. And interestingly and oddly, this passage is from the sheep's perspective. So we have to use our imaginations to get there. What did David mean when he says, I want nothing more? It's a big thing to not want. Because I want all the time. I want a meal. I want comfort. I want security. I want happiness. I want time, peace, love. I mean, I could go on and on. And I am rarely satisfied. Listen to these words from Jason Lehman in the poem that he wrote a few years ago. It was spring, but it was summer I wanted. The warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted. The colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted. The beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted. The warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted. The freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted. <laughs> the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. Then my life was over, and I never got what I wanted. We live in a world of discontent that often produces fear. Most of us never seem satisfied, and almost everybody wants more. In our psalm, David refers to himself as a sheep. Frequently in the Bible, human beings are often compared to sheep. But you understand, that's not necessarily a compliment. Because sheep are said to be some of the dumbest and dirtiest animals in the world. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. He's not saying that's good. He's saying often we just are on the same level as sheep, and sometimes we get lost. When Jesus looked out on the crowd of people, the gospel writer says he, he saw them, and he said, as sheep, they're as sheep without a shepherd. Jesus longing to be that shepherd in their lives. Again, this was not a compliment from Jesus. It was a statement of concern because sheep are vulnerable when left alone. How much do you know about sheep? I didn't know that much about sheep. I thought I knew more about sheep than I did know about sheep until I actually started reading about sheep, and there's a lot to know about sheep. It's a good use of a scripture. It's a great illustration to use sheep when we think about our journey of faith. Because I had to learn it, you're going to learn it too. Here are some of the things that I learned about sheep this past couple of weeks that confirms our author's concerns and worries. Did you know? You're going to hear this a lot. Did you know that sheep will actually ruin a pasture eating every blade of grass unless shepherds make their sheep move to new pastures? If left in one place too long, they will just eat every single blade of grass right down to the dirt. And then they'll have nothing. Did you know? I didn't know this. Did you know that sheep have about a 320 degree vision? They can see 320 degrees without turning their head, which sounds good, except they're nearsighted and they have poor depth perception. So at the end of the day, it doesn't help them that much. They also can't see very well in the dark, so they easily and often stumble. It's said that sheep are so stubborn that they will die of thirst if their water has mud or is covered with algae. 
and they're easily frightened. Even a startled rabbit will cause a stampede of sheep. It makes sense, but I didn't realize that sheep really have no means of self-defense either. Their teeth and their hooves are very dull. The only real recourse if attacked is running as far and as fast as possible. But they're also pretty slow and they have short legs. Not a great defense. Lastly, sheep have no homing instincts if they get lost. A dog, you know, those stories, a dog, a horse, a cat, they get lost and months later they show up again. Sheep can't do that. If a sheep gets lost, they're lost. If it loses sight of the flock or home, they're lost until someone comes to rescue them. So when scripture describes people as sheep, it's not exactly flattering but helpful, helpful to pay attention to, I think. King David is writing our psalm based on his life experiences. David has been a shepherd watching over these very dependent animals. David would have led, comforted, found, and protected his share of sheep. He knows what he's talking about. This scripture, the 23rd Psalm, was written probably when David was king, and he had found similarities in leading people as he had led flocks of sheep. However, in our psalm, David is likely connecting his personal insight to his relationship with God. This scripture explains how he has experienced God in his personal life, maybe even more helpful for us today. David makes the comparison that human shepherds are responsible for their flock A shepherd must identify with the flock. A shepherd must always be near the flock. A shepherd must fight for the flock. A shepherd must even be willing to die for that flock. So some takeaways for us this morning from this psalm are that there is a psalm, that this is a psalm of confidence, a psalm of dependence, a psalm of trust. Let me unpack that a little bit for us this morning. The following line from our scripture, you let me lie down in green meadows. It's helpful for us to think about the life of a sheep. For sheep to be content and to lie down for the night, they require four things. I also didn't know these things. First of all, they have to be full. Hungry sheep stay on their feet, searching for another mouthful of food. They eat, they eat, they eat, and they eat until they're content. That sounds like me. Secondly, they must feel safe. Sheep will not lie down if they are scared. The slightest suspicion of danger will make them stay on their feet, ready to run, even if it's just from a little bunny moving. Thirdly, they must be comfortable. They will not lie down if flies or fleas or other irritants are bothering them. And finally, and I find this interesting, sheep will only lie down if there's harmony in the flock. If there's friction amongst them, if other sheep are having a problem, they won't lie down or sleep. Just as human shepherds seek to fulfill their needs from their beloved sheep, can we believe? Can we believe that our heavenly shepherd desire is for you and me to experience hope and peace and fulfillment? And can we find that in our shepherd's promises in scripture and as we try to understand God? God's promised love and presence, will that be enough? Can that be enough for us? Our psalmist goes on to tell us, you lead me beside restful waters. Sheep are often frightened by so many things, including fast-moving water. Turns out sheep are poor swimmers. Another thing on that list. They get bogged down with their heavy wool coats. When the Hubert shepherd comes to a moving stream, they don't try to force the shepherd to drink. Instead, a shepherd will build a dam and, and a pool where a sheep then can drink from still water. I think that's an encouragement to us in terms of God's relationship with us. 
not a forceful relationship, not a damnation of some sort, not a pushed into a parenthesis, but an invitation. Let me create this, the actual place where I'm inviting you to come in a relationship with me. Come take a drink, be sustained. A fast moving stream with rapids can be exciting, but it does not promote rest. The picture here is a quiet moving stream, comforting and safe, leading to life. Water often the symbol of life in scripture. Sheep, like us, at times make bad decisions. Sheep at times wander off and get lost. The shepherd who knows their sheep is eager to find that lost one. All shepherds actually pursue their sheep and are filled with joy when one is found. During our question time, we were sitting at a table and we were talking about stories about sheep. And one of the women at the table said that when she puts her Christmas crush out, she sometimes will take a sheep and hide it somewhere else in the house and see if the grandkids can find it. And when they do, it gives her an opportunity to tell the story of the shepherd who always wants to find that lost sheep. Isn't that beautiful? In our psalm, David speaks of his soul being restored, that God is pursuing us, eager to find us and restore us. Is he speaking of the stress and anxiety and fear of his past and uncertainty of the future? Well, I think so. David offers in faith his belief that this shepherd is not just willing, but is actively wanting to love and protect and care for their sheep. He provides this metaphor to describe his relationship with a faithful, diligent, and intentional God. That same God who is with and for us. This passage causes me to wonder why the shepherd would care so much for a single wayward, stinky, troublemaking sheep. David's answer, you guide me to lush pastures for the sake of your name. Let me read that again. You guide me to lush pastures for the sake of your name. In biblical times, shepherds would be judged by how they cared for their flock. Shepherds took great pride in caring for their flock. They were also motivated because they would be expected to pay for any lost sheep, so they didn't like losing sheep. Our shepherd, our heavenly shepherd leads us as this demonstration of God's own faithful and constant character. So if we follow the shepherd, might we experience more of the life intended for us and in turn provide more life to those around us? It seems like it's a first and second step. As the passage goes on, it says, even if I'm surrounded by the shadows of death, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they give me courage. I like this translation. A lot of translations talks about comfort here. But in this translation, it talks about courage. Your rod, your staff, they give me courage. God's desire for us is to have courage to face the challenges of our day. Friends, it's helpful to remember that even though we might choose the right path and seek to follow our shepherd, it can still be challenging. We know that, don't we? The psalmist describes the journey with the shepherd as passing through the darkest of valleys. Remember the poor eyesight of the sheep, sometimes accepting that the shepherd's path will still have dangers and disappointments and loss is hard. It challenges us to wonder if we will and can trust the shepherd. King David, in his passage, declares that he's not afraid of what might come from the darkness or the unknown because he chooses to trust that the shepherd will be with him. With him. Not ahead of him, not behind him, but with him. Our opportunity this morning as we're pondering is can we trust this same promise? Can we still Trust this promised assurance from the good shepherd that whatever happens on the paths of our lives, that God is and will be with us. A first grader stood in front of the classroom to make a speech about what I want to be when I grow up. 
They said their most grown-up voice, I'm going to be a lion tamer. I'm going to be a lion tamer and have lots and lots and lots of fierce lions. I'll walk into the cage and they will roar. The passion was evident and the class's imagination allowed them to see the scene that was being described. Our little lion tamer paused momentarily, thinking through what they had just said, adding, but of course, my mommy will be with me. <laughs> David understood two significant points about God and God's character that we can take to heart this morning. David wrote, our only goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house, Yahweh, for days without end. In our relationship with God, I wonder if it's possible to find comfort in acknowledging God's character. Accepting God is good and merciful can often bring us the comfort that we need to face the journey wherever we are. And while the shepherd will not always offer us a life without hardship, this good shepherd promises to always, always, always be with us, even through the darkest valley or shadows of death. Thanks be to God for these promises to be with us, to be that good shepherd for us. And to that I would say amen. For it's what I long to believe. How about you? Let's pray. God, we are grateful for these promises. Even if we can't fully get there today, thank you for the promise that we can lean into to see if you might show up in those places where we desperately need you to, in our lives, in the world around us. The world is complicated. Our lives are complicated. Having faith in you is complicated. So God, we pray by the power of your spirit that you would come and speak to us, speak into our souls in ways that we might understand. And then give us the courage, as we've just heard from Scripture, to follow. For we pray this in your name. Amen.